Praise, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ this morning. Today we continue to work through the season of Advent, colors of blue, and I'm in a clerical communicating a message. We are in a penitential season. We are in a season of preparation for a most holy event, celebration of the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not just the first time, but also preparing our hearts for the second time. The gospel is our text for this morning. Please join me in prayer. Father, we ask, O Lord, for your blessings upon the study of your holy word and the meditation of it. We thank you for this gift, as it one day became flesh and dwelt among us. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to celebrate not just the event of the first, but to look forward to the day of the Lord, as John proclaimed, when all things will be made right, crooked ways made straight, mountains made low, valleys filled. Help us, O oh Lord, be ready for that day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, this congregation went through a call process just a little while ago. And when congregations go through call processes, they get information from the district, the Texas district here. And I don't know exactly what the Texas district had to share with you about me, but I'm kind of wondering what the district that John resided in would have shared about him. Hmm. Name, John the Baptist. Unkempt, unprofessional dress, odd diet, quirky personality, eccentric person overall, abrasive preaching, early 30s. Oh, well, maybe he might get along with our youth. But today, you kind of wonder if anybody would ever call a guy like John the Baptist. You wonder why people went out to him in droves to hear the message he was proclaiming. A message that seemed to be very abrasive to the human condition, to the human mind, to the human heart. Why? Well, maybe the conversations were going around in Israel, something like this. You know, there's a guy out there saying that the end of the world is near, the day of the Lord is coming, and he's got a point because it's been prophesied for years. And everything around this guy seems to point he is the preparer. And so if the day of the Lord is actually coming, what must I do to be ready? And so they would go to their local synagogues, their rabbis, and they would ask them, if the day of the Lord comes among me, in my time, what must I do to be ready? And you get the idea the rabbis and the synagogue leaders were telling them this. Oh, you're a child of Abraham. You don't need to worry. Your blood got you covered. But when they heard that message, it must not have set easy with them. It wasn't bringing them peace. And so they went out to hear a message that hopefully would bring them a sense of peace, that if the day of the Lord was to come in their lifetime, they would be ready, and God would welcome them. But what did they have to face as they went out to hear him? You brood of vipers! Well, you're ready for that. They were. Because deep down inside, that's what they believed they were. Do not begin to say to yourself, we are children of Abraham. He's got a point. That's what the rabbis have been telling us, and it's not sitting well with me. It's not giving me peace with God. And so John said, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And that is what they came to hear. Abrasive message, but yet something that resonated deep down inside with them as they got to hear not only who they were, but they also heard the gospel as John proclaimed a repentance of baptism and for forgiveness of sins, and they walked away with the peace they were looking for. And they went home. And other people began to see the peace on their faces they didn't have. And they wanted to know where. And they said, go to John. He's got a message that's going to cut you to the heart. But it's going to give you a peace that is beyond all understanding. 
And of course, John's message not only consisted of the accusatory purpose of the law, you are a sinner, you are a brood of vipers, but the message of John in our gospel reading today also consisted of the third use of the law, the guide, the guidance of what should we do? How should fruit of repentance look in my personal life? The crowd said, what shall we do? Now that we've got this peace, what shall we do? John said, well, if you've got two tunics, share with the one who has none. The same thing with food. The repentant person looks and strives for economic equality among the citizens they live. They do want not to see any suffering. And if they do, they strive to alleviate it to the best of their ability. And tax collectors, they too came to John saying, what does a repentant life look in my lifestyle? John said, surprisingly, just do what you're told. Do not take any more money than you're asked to. Because back in those days, tax collectors were considered pagans. They were actually kicked out of the synagogues. And here John the Baptist said, you don't have to leave the profession. You just need to be honest in your profession. You're fulfilling a responsibility that God wants you to do in this world. For the reason why tax collectors were looked upon so badly in society is because Rome said, this is the area you are in charge of. We did a census. If you catch that in Luke chapter 2, you know they're doing a census, and that's why they're all going into Bethlehem, because Rome wants a head count, and then it figures out what taxes they should get from that area. So they figure out from their census how much taxes should be taking place, and they tell the tax collector, this is what we need from that area. Whatever you charge is yours to keep. Above that is yours to keep. They were overcharging. And John said, a repentant Christian will not do that. Do not ask for more than what you are required. And the second reason why tax collectors were so dishonored in society is because some of them, like Matthew, gospel, written after him, right? He was a tax collector. They're saying you're working for the enemy. You're working for our occupiers. How in the world can you even think that God would accept you when you work for the other side? John said, you can be a tax collector. Just be fair. Same thing with being a soldier. Just do what you're told. Do not use your position in a way in which forces people to do things they ought not to be. And do not abuse your power. It's all right to be a soldier. Just stay honest. And use your re powers responsibly. Bearing fruits of repentance in their life. So John talks about a primary repentance and a secondary repentance. Primary works the forgiveness of sins as it brings you to contrition and sorrow of your sins. Secondary fruits are what takes place in your life. So you kind of wonder today how the message of John the Baptist would play out, as they say in Peoria or in America at large. Would people come to hear that message today? Would people come to a church where the pastor points his finger at them and says, You brood of vipers! They want to hear that message today. It seems from what I am seeing taking place out there and is that everybody kind of likes that third use of the law. They don't like the accusatory use of the law where the pastor points a finger and says, you brood of vipers, but they like the third use of the law. How can I become better? What must I do to be a better father, a husband, mother, wife? What must I do to be a better worker? How do the fruits of repentance work in my daily life? But you know, when you're only talking about the third use of the law, you don't need the cross. You don't need the altar. Get rid of them. All you need in those messages is exhortation and encouragement. Go out there and do better. The Holy Spirit. We'll make you the better father. Here's some steps and some guidelines. I'll put them up on the screen. Step one, step two, step three. That's how you become a better father. That's how you become a better worker. No cross, no altar needed, just a screen. But when you preach the gospel, the word of God correctly, you wish to proclaim the primary fruits of repentance, which means you have a cross and an altar. 
because the altar is very important in association with the cross. It is the altar that communicates the message. The cross was not symbolizing the death of a criminal who is being executed for his own offenses. The altar communicates that on the cross, an innocent man died for the offenses of others, for the brood of vipers that you and I are. The altar communicates the cross. It's a place of sacrifice. And in the word of God, when that is proclaimed, we hear that we are a brood of vipers. We are dead stones. As St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We just cannot live on the fact that we are just simple human beings and God's got to love us just because we're born. If that was the case, these two things would not be needed. These came into our life because we needed a rebirth by the grace of Jesus Christ dying on the cross so that we might become living stones. As Peter confesses in his epistle. That's what the word of God does in our lives. It creates both primary and secondary fruits of repentance. It brings us to our knees, but gives us that peace, that Christmas peace, which we so need to have peace within ourselves, with our God, and with our neighbor. In Romans chapter 5, we are justified by faith through Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. That's what Christ came into the world to bring us Christmas peace. The priest that John the Baptist talked about years ago. And I hope that's the peace you're hearing here. When the word of God is proclaimed in this church, that the gospel is being brought to your heart, driving you to bear fruits of repentance, first to contrition, and then secondary fruits in your vocations, to be responsible with whatever place God has placed you, so that fruits of repentance go outside the walls of this parish, outside the walls of this church. It goes into your place of your work, your family, your play, and just hopefully, just hopefully, that people will begin to see the peace on your face. And they'll want to know, where do you get that? And you'll direct them to the nearest John the Baptist in the area. Where they too can receive the peace which surpasses all understanding. The Christmas peace Christ has brought us. With God and with each other. In his name, amen.